auditor, the very well recognized auditor will be introduced formally by senior professor of uh, UCSC, Professor Andy Kodikara. So we'd like to very warmly invite Professor Andy Kodikara for the formal introduction to our orator who will be on stage in a moment. Chief Guest, Chairman of the University Grants Commission, Chancellor of the University of Colombo, Vice Chancellor, Deans, Distinguished Guests, Mrs. Samaranayaka and family members, Director and the staff of the UCSC, staff of the other faculties, students, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of computing at the University of Colombo. We are also having the Professor V.K. Samaranayaka Oration 2017. I am pleased to introduce the orator, Emirates Professor Roger Stern. Professor Stern obtained his B.Sc. degree in Mathematics and Physics in 1966 and M.Sc. in Statistics in 1968, both from the University of Sussex, United Kingdom. He received his Ph.D. in Statistics from the University of Reading in 1972. In 1974, then Dr. Roger Stern, a young senior lecturer of the University of Reading, was invited to visit the Faculty of Science, University of Colombo, for a two-year assignment to promote the statistical unit of the mathematics department to a national center for statistics research, teaching, and consultancy. This visit was under a 10-year Colombo Reading Link program funded by the British government. The LINK program was initiated by late Professor Samaranayaka. As the university did not have computers, it, it was soon realized the computing facilities need to be established in order to do teaching computing and also for statistical data analysis. Dr. Roger Stern initiated the purchase of the first computer for the university, HP 9825, mini computer under this link program. This computer had a single line display, a card reader, and a thermal printer. He also contributed later to purchase many computers, including the Data General Eclipse S140 computer. Today we are celebrating the 50th anniversary in computing. It is very appropriate to have an orator who has contributed significantly to build the computing facilities at the university. In 1982, uh, Professor Stern brought a BBC microcomputer to the Columbia University even before it was released to the UK market. Since then, several BBC computers were purchased by the university and a BBC microcomputer lab was established. Professor Stern realized the potential of this little computer and he wanted to develop a statistics, statistical package to be used on this computer. He initiated a project to develop a statistical package in STAT, together with the staff of the statistical unit and the Reading University. He was an excellent programmer and came up with a brilliant idea of memory management to utilize the limited memory available in this computer to run a large system. We witnessed this development taking place as junior staff members of the statistical unit. Our Vice Chancellor, also a staff member of the statistical unit at that time. One, notice, one noticeable feature which we have seen about Dr. Stern was his efficiency of working. He was very active, quick in his work, and also make decisions with the others. When he worked with Professor Samaranayaka, it was a perfect combination, and they did a lot of work together. He also contributed to establish the MSc in Applied Statistics degree program under the Colombo Reading Link. Under this program, many staff members of the Reading University visited the statistical unit for teaching and consultancy in statistics. 
Some staff members of the Department of Mathematics visited the UK and obtained their postgraduate research degrees from the universities in UK. Professor Stern supported the establishment of SCADS, Statistical Consultancy and Data Processing Service at the Statistical Unit to provide services to other organizations and research institutes such as CRI, RRI, TRI, etc. Professor Stern started the project to collect and analyze rainfall climatic data in Sri Lanka from more than 100 stations for about 100 years. This was a massive project with computer-based data processing which involved many staff members and research assistants. He also started a survey with using RICE data as well. Considering his immense contribution to the areas of statistics and computing at the university, he was conferred the Doctor of Science honoris causa by the University of Colombo at the convocation held in 1984. Professor Stern provided his services to many African countries in similar way. From 1990 to 1997, he served as a chief statistician of the International Crops Research Institute for the semi-arid tropics in Niger. From 1977 to 1916, Professor Stern served as a chief biometrician and professor of, professor of applied statistics in the Statistical Services Center in the University of Reading. Since, 19, since 2016, he is working as the director of the Statistics for Sustainable Development Center in the Reading University. I invite Professor Stern to the stage. Before Professor Stern commences his uh, oration, we'll be inviting the director of uh, the UCSC, Professor K.P. Hewagamage, who will uh, Garland, Professor Stern, with the Oration Medal. So we'd like to very warmly invite Professor Hewa Gamage on stage for the garlanding, and thereafter we commence the oration. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, when I was asked to give this 10th uh, oration, I, I felt very humbled, uh, but it was a wonderful occasion for me to remember uh, such a great person and somebody I considered a close friend. At that time, I did not realize um, that this was not only the 10th oration, but it was also 50 years of computing. Not only that, I think one can sometimes judge somebody not just by what they did when they were here, but also by what happened when they left. And this building is a testimony to the uh, tireless efforts, I think, of the university and his staff. So I warmly congratulate um, the uh, University of Colombo uh, Service for Computers and the staff of the university. I think this is a wonderful testimony, not just to Professor Samranaika, but to all the staff here. So many congratulations to you all. So, <clears throat> as has been said, um, I was the same era. When Professor Samranaika um, first taught Fortran programming, I first arrived in Reading University uh, to teach statistics. Um, and statistics and computing, as you've seen in this discussion, 
are, have been very closely intertwined in the history of this university and I think are an impressive part of that history. The Vice-Chancellor has challenged everybody to go across the borders of these different faculties and departments and I think that's also an interesting example uh, where statistics is now in the science faculty and separate from computing, but I hope we'll continue to work extremely closely together, not least because this new-ish subject of data science provides a challenge to do so. So, when I, when, I'm afraid I'm going to call him Prof, because I always thought of him either as Sam or Prof. He was a very humble and easy person to get on with, um, as well as being just a wonderful person and such a great instigator of so many things. While he was teaching Fortran programming in Reading, I was using these machines with my students. And this, I think, is an idea of the difference. When I arrived in 1973, we'd only just stopped using them. And I don't know if you realize that teaching mathematics even with those machines, just what a difference that was. <clears throat> you see the handle at the side. If you want to take two numbers and divide them, you turn the handle anti-clockwise until the bell rings. And then you turn it back once and you've done one place on your division. This was the way students, not in Sri Lanka, but students in the UK were having to do their work. Uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. <clears throat> I arrived partly because there were problems at the time with statistics. And so my job here was to help statistics become more applied. And some problems with statistics still persist today. Because many people need some statistical skills. And the training for many non-statisticians used to have problems. And it was sometimes so bad, they didn't like statistics, even after their training. And they else didn't like statisticians very much. What was not so clear to them is statisticians in the past weren't trained very well either. They often lacked planning and data management skills. They were taught the theory. They were taught the nice analyses. They often lacked communication skills. And a good applied statistician is always one of a team. There was very little team building taught to statistics students. They didn't have many marketing skills. And so I found that unless one was careful, they were often sidelined in important developments and research projects. They sat there, they bemoaned their fate, whereas things happened around them. What was going wrong? Training was dominated by analysis. There wasn't enough on organizing the data. There wasn't enough on design. Often a recipe book approach was used. And we had many people coming to us to say, I have this data, which test should I use? Because they thought that like a recipe, you just had to find the test and then you could do your analysis. And this wasn't with understanding of principles. Training emphasized formulae and often hand calculation, even when computers were around. And the argument was, when you do it by hand, you get understanding. But many years have shown that that doesn't necessarily follow. And there were very little people giving good experience of computers for good statistical practices. This is what I arrived to try and help with 40 years ago. My concern, and unlike Professor Samuel and Ayaka, perhaps this indicates what a failure I've been, is that in many countries that I now work, these remain as problems. And I do feel that, as has been said, with the status of this university and the quality of both computing and statistics, maybe the university is not being ambitious enough in thinking of it on the world stage. If I just give the one example, when we started our link, we had a very strong department of statistics at Reading, and it was building up here. It was such a pleasure to visit the department of statistics on Monday and see they are enormously strong. And I would be sending people to Colombo University Statistics 
far easily, far more easily, that I wouldn't send them to Reading anymore. And I, I'm very saddened to say this. We, about 20 years ago, we were quite strong. We now have five statisticians at Reading. You have 20 here, 10 with PhDs. And so the teaching here, quite unlike in many countries, and I give the contrast that I asked students who were statistics students starting their masters how large the data sets were that they'd analyzed in their courses. Many of the students had not analyzed any data at all, even though they were statistics students. And the largest data set from any student from any of the 60 countries had 60 rows of data. This is nothing in this day and age. When I asked the same question here on Monday, I got a multitude of answers. They are being taught in a modern and disciplined way that I think many countries could learn from. So the results often with the poor teaching are graduates with a near universal dislike of statistics, but a realization that they need it in their research work. So the strong demand for relevant in-service training. <clears throat> and most of these past weaknesses in statistics were similar for statisticians. There was a secret that the statisticians didn't want you to know. A common statement by a statistician was, gosh, they've come to me too late and their experiment or their survey hasn't been well designed. They should have come earlier. And luckily, nobody came earlier because actually the statisticians hadn't been taught very much about design either. And so they, but they never needed to answer those questions. <clears throat> so we needed to improve the teaching of statistics. And that's been one of my interests for my whole life. So the first paper we ever published was on the use of a computer for the teaching of statistics. I find it interesting that this was a computer, because in this day and age, in 1973, a university in the West would have a computer, and the university in Colombo, as you saw, had none, but there was one at the Department of Census. But you wouldn't have computers the way you saw later on. <clears throat> and it was clear that compute, the computer in a UK university uh, was going to become bigger and bigger, and life was going to be simple. And all that changed in the early 80s. But it was clear from very early on that the computer could help, or the computers could help enormously in teaching statistics. I also give this as an example that I sometimes find on my travels that people think of research rather narrowly. Research on teaching is research. We had a link, as many of you have heard of, and we published the link as a piece of research in a very reputable journal. So I urge people who are thinking of research and perhaps fearing that their teaching is going to get in the way of their research to perhaps consider they could add another line of research, which is research into effective teaching, and that could make their teaching even better. So in 1973, I arrived in Colombo, <coughs> and um, I won't go through the absurdity of the fact that I was supposed to make the teaching more useful for the country and they took somebody out of the UK who was rather young, who'd never been to the continent before, and I was supposed to do this. And there were some odd happenings around in 73, which meant by the time that Professor Samaranaika came back in 74, I did know about the country and what statistics was being used. I found eight computers in the country, none in the university, but we had access to two, and I used to cycle. I was in charge of this card punch and used to cycle to the Department of Census and Statistics with a, a, a whole deck of cards behind me and a very large umbrella, just in case it rained. Uh, computing has changed. I was there to support undergraduate teaching, and Professor Samuel Eicher returned, and he was appointed as the department head. And then Ian Wilson came from Reading also, and he supported the start of the MSc course, and then we had the link. It had started informally well before that, but <clears throat> this is what Ian, and I hope you'll excuse me that you may have to read some of this because I don't think I want to read it out, um, wrote about uh, Professor Samaranayaka. Um, and I just want to, as you read it, <clears throat> I just want to pick up on this aspect that Sam worked in his own way. And his way was extremely effective. It wasn't conventional. And we learned from it.
Perhaps vice chancellor shouldn't see things like this uh, because it might give too many people ideas for the future. This isn't quite finished, um, but another aspect of Professor Samranaka was that he was a university person, so he loved argument, and he didn't mind being criticized, and the logic of it, and he, he, he was a very straightforward person. And a number of you have also mentioned he was tremendous at multitasking. So I still have a very vivid memory of him sitting there in his office, and I brought along a visitor who was from another country. And uh, Sam welcomed him, and sat, he sat down in front, and then they started talking. But it was a typical meeting where there were also one person on the left and one person on the right and a third person on the phone. And this international visitor, and I was there, this international visitor got out and walked out. And Sam said, what's his problem? I was giving him my full attention. And the amazing thing is, he was. He was also giving all the other people his full attention, but somehow he could do that. So if you wondered why so much happened, he was a tremendous multitasker in an amazing way. And the way his mind could switch between different topics um, was, was just fabulous. So we had the link, and we wrote up about the link, and it involved all the Reading Department. <clears throat> and Robert Kernow, who was in one of the early pictures there, was our, if we had an equivalent to Sam, it was Professor Robert Kernow, who became a very eminent statistician, and he and all the department benefited tremendously. So I'm sorry you've got another little bit of reading, but there isn't much more after, because I asked him to say a little bit about the link, and this is what he writes. This also gives me the opportunity to follow uh, Robert Kernow and mention myself, Professor, uh, Dr. Savitri Abesekara, um, who was another absolutely key person in our connection at this time. And um, she, uh, that story continues a little bit um, because Ian Wilson followed me and set up the MSc. He was then with his wife Jennifer and in 1985 they separated. And it's to my great pleasure that in 1990, Savitri, then in the UK, married Ian and is now Savitri Wilson. So our link certainly continues in one way, and I wonder whether it continue, could continue in other ways. I would like to take a number of topics that we did in this link that I think are still around today. And and then there's some questions in these. So one of them, the first is statistical games. The second, as you've heard, I'm very interested, climate, the, improving the climate for statistics was intended to, to be partly the idea of what is climate, and, 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 and that's because we do work on climate work. What about the consulting service and statistical software? So let me start with the games. In the crop cutting survey is something that's happened in Sri Lanka since 1952. Rice is so important in Sri Lanka. And here's a graph of the crop cutting survey. And in about 1978, um, a lady called Anila Vijasinghe came. She's now, I think, Anila Dias Bandaranayaka. And she just came for a shorter visit. And one of her jobs was to see whether we could turn the crop cutting survey into a game. And we did a statistical game, uh, really a simulation. Uh, I should tell you one other small story about her, which she won't like, but I don't mind that. Um, <coughs> the, um, she arrived on her first morning, about, she arrived maybe at nine o'clock, and at 12 o'clock, um, the administrator of our department came to see me and said, um, uh, this lady, Anilla, is very charismatic, isn't she? And I said, yes, yes, she's a very interesting lady. And she said, yes, you know, we have four secretaries in the department now, 
we had secretaries in those days, and they've all stopped all their other work, and they're all working for her. And uh, she had that ability, and this is why she was very productive. So we invented a game, and this was a survey game. And we challenged students. At that stage, of course, we didn't have many computers. So the idea was that we would challenge students, usually working in pairs, to design their survey from the 160 farmers in these 10 villages. But the villages were a different size. So they first had to decide how many villages, then they decide how many fields and which field, and then what plots within the field to do their crop cutting. And choosing a plot, which you can picture, um, meant choosing an envelope in those days. And they chose the envelope, but they would interview the envelope. And when they interviewed the envelope on this one, this had a size of one acre. Um, it had fertilizer of 200 weights per acre, and it was old improved rice. And then, from within the envelope, they could take one or two slips of paper to get the yield. They now had their data, which they had to enter into a spreadsheet uh, or into a statistics package, and then they had to do the analysis. I do find one aspect of this interesting, that most, many statistics problems are multi-level. When I look at what's being promoted as data science, I don't see multi-level coming in very much. I think we're going back a step in some aspects. So we invented this game, and of course it was played with envelopes. Here you're looking at the survey, which is captured from the computer version of the game, which we made in the 1990s. However, we found that playing the game on the computer had a few problems. They didn't seem to get the hang of it as much as where you put these villages out on a large set of table and people could visualize the population and then the sample and then the data and the analysis from the beginning of the study to the end. Much better if they actually saw it physically. By the year about 2010, when we tried to use the computer version, the language had disappeared and we couldn't get it. And we still now find that the last time we used this was this time last year, and many students, 54 MSc students, found this highly novel and educational. So this is one of the things we started with 40 years ago. And here's some of the data from it. And we use this as an example to show simple data analysis. I just want to draw your attention to these villages. I don't know if any Sri Lankans here recognize these villages. They're rather unusual names for Sri Lanka villages. The first one is Sabi, which stands for Savitri Abhisekara. <laughs> then there's Kesson. Now you may get the idea of Kevin Seniviratna. Followed by the person who just proposed me, uh, Nihal Kodikara. And then I felt it was wonderful that I'd been doing all this liaison with Nandasara, and there he is immortalized in our statistical game. Climate. As Professor Kodikara has said, we spent a long time analyzing climatic data. This was a long time before climate change became so important. And I do think there is continued scope for continuing these analyses. And so this is another of these areas that is in the past with our link that I think can continue. <clears throat> these data that we use are not used much by the National Met Services. They're all trained in physics and meteorology, not statistics. This was an era before the National Met Services guard their daily data uh, as much as they do now. Um, there are ways around that which we need to find. But I think there's quite scope for coming there. And currently, the world over, because of climate change, there's tremendous emphasis on uh, climate work, especially in agriculture for small-scale farmers. And I'm showing you here what it usually does. Most projects for small-scale farmers start by going to the meteorological department and they say to them, we've got a big project, what can you do? They're all trained in physics and meteorology. 
So they say, we can improve our forecast and we can also have a, a long-term forecast, a seasonal forecast, <coughs> which is absolutely true. But what we did, because we've got the statistics, is we added a component long before the season where we analyze the long-term data. We don't have problems getting the data from the National Met Service because we ask them to do the analyses. We don't ask for their data. Who's going to give them the capacity building so they can do the analysis? Well, I think it should be the computing and statistics people within the university. And this is a project which is in many countries. I haven't seen it in Sri Lanka, but many countries in Africa and in the Caribbean is, is current now. And part of the interest in this, and this is an example from Western Kenya, is that many people are amazed that you don't need education to look at pictures and to count. So doing the analyses and working out the risks for themselves, here's a sample of African villages from the west of Kenya, most of the ladies having had zero education at all. And they have no problem with the calculations they're being asked to do. And being asked to do the calculation has brought the subject alive to them, and they very much enjoy this. <clears throat> My third subject is statistical consultancy. My belief, and I haven't changed when I arrived in 1973, is if you're truly going to do applied statistics, you must apply the statistics yourself. Otherwise, you, you go into the more theory. And in Colombo, I took a list of the consultancy we gave. And this is a very small list. I've given a few more in the written version of the paper. But there's really quite a lot of impressive clients here of, uh, and this means you bring these topics back into your teaching. In Reading University, we didn't do it, but we did it slightly differently. We set up the Statistical Services Centre in 1983, which was 100% self-financing, um, but we were very keen on having a lot of consultancy work with the un within the university for outside people as well. Now, what's the situation? Well, Colombo University, the statistics department, it's all part of the Colombo Science and Technology Cell, which has set itself up as a limited company based in the university. Perfect. It's working very well. And it's going to be a big success for another very special reason, because their office is exactly where I started work almost 45 years ago. It's in the statistical unit. So obviously, it's destined for success. Um, in Reading, what we found is universities have become less conducive, so we moved out of the university, but we're continuing our consultancy work, and we're linking with a number of other universities now. Statistical software. I have a question, because I'm with lots and lots of computer people. I don't know another subject like this. Maybe you can say Fortran is still alive, but it's not as favored as it was before. SAS and SPSS if you're interested in statistics, are the standard statistics packages that you would know about, particularly SPSS. And it started 50 years ago. It's the 50th anniversary of these statistics packages. Most software isn't like that. If I give you quickly an example, everybody now uses Excel, but they didn't always use Excel. Before Excel, there was Lotus, and everybody used Lotus. And before Lotus was VisiCalc, and we're still not back to the 80s. What are the other subjects? And I'm going to ask the other visitors to tell me the other domains where the standard software now is 50 years old. And that's very interesting, in, to my mind, in a number of ways, because if you take SPSS, every time there's a new invention in statistics, they add it. But they never subtract anything. That's incredibly confusing for students. So microcomputers came uh, in the 1980s, and there were lots and lots of stats packages, including our little Instat, which, as you heard, was jointly developed by the computer people within our unit here and between and Reading. We then added climatic facilities. And I have to say, slightly sadly, that it's still used today. Very few of the packages in the 80s are used today. It's still used today because things like the start of the rains and dry spells aren't in any other, or there, are, there isn't other good software for that. But it needs to change. 
And I'm doing a sidetrack now, which I can do very quickly, because as has been told, we started, we, we actually contributed to the election, and I was there the first time this happened. Um, and that continues still. And this is the message from uh, the then Vice Chancellor um, to Professor Samranaika um, and the team. Um, to, no, this was by the Commissioner of the Elections to the Vice Chancellor. Um, I will just tell you one story about that. Um, when the Commissioner of Elections this first time round was using Professor Samranaika's computing, he was extremely suspicious. He felt that this newfangled idea wasn't going to work. I have to say, if he'd known about our standard of programming, he wouldn't have let us in the building, never mind be suspicious. And we were very lucky. But it did work. In the end, he felt his team down in the basement were going to be very slow, but at least they would not make mistakes. Luckily for us, he didn't see the mistakes we made. But there were four discrepancies between the computer results and his team. They were only small, but they were all his team. So by the end, he was more convinced, but not very convinced. When the last district had been announced, we immediately had the results. Of course, we were using a computer. His team down in the basement had to add up again for all the districts. Meanwhile, the television cameras were there. As you heard, it was the first presidential, and J.R. Jaya Wardner was there, and the whole cabinet was there. And these television cameras were trained on the commissioner. And of course, nothing was happening because he was waiting for his team. And the television continued, and the cabinet sat there in the town hall. Sam was just behind. And it went on and on and on. After just over an hour, the commissioner lost his nerve and said, Professor Samranaika, could you give me the results? And Sam had scribbled them down on a bit of paper, which is highly unofficial, and handed them over to the commissioner. We knew that J.R. Jaya Wardner had just over 51%. And therefore, there was no second round, and he was the president. And this was now read out. And a little bit later, he came to see Sam. He said, I'm very relieved. Two things. One, I got the same result from down there. And two, that took another hour and a half afterwards. And um, so a little known story about that first time. But we survived, and as you've heard, it's been used ever since. What about our Instat? Well, we now believe R is the future. And so we're now hard at work on what we call R in STAT, with the same sort of objectives. And I just wonder whether here's one of the items where we could pick up our link and work together once again. We would find that very nice. We're two years into a project developing a front end to R to make it even easier, and also to help the climatic analyses be modernized so I can at last throw my old instat away. I want to finish with three more topics. I've given you the first one. What now? Sadly, Sam has not been here for the last 10 years. I've picked out three topics from the last 10 years, and I wonder whether he would have jumped on this bandwagon. Maybe you have already. Maybe things would be different. So the first is computer-based maths. Each one of them has a TED talk. So this is a very um, stimulating talk by a man called Conrad Wolfram, who is the brother of Stephen Wolfram, who is Mathematica, saying we should teach children and university people real math with computers. And his complaint is that currently, and it's the same in England, or in the UK, we tend to teach calculating. We teach arithmetic and then algebra and then a bit of calculus, but we're teaching people how to calculate, all by hand. We should use the computer for all this, and then we can teach much more than calculating. And he makes a very persuasive argument. 
Of course, people have objections. One of the objections is you need to learn with paper first, and then you can move to the computer. And he gives a very nice argument about this. Here's his daughter, who's eight. And he says to his daughter, his daughter has a hobby, which you sort of see here, which is she draws computers on pieces of paper. And he said to his daughter one day, you know, when I was your age, I didn't do that. I didn't draw computers on pieces of paper. Can you think why that is? And she thought for a minute, and then she said, no paper? <laughs> and his point is that just because paper is invented before computers, once they're both around, does it matter which order they appeared in? Why does basic always mean you use the oldest one first? And there is certainly food for thought. However, before you jump on this bandwagon, you should look at his website, because it does seem to me it's an interesting example of a wonderful set of ideas that you could learn from, but putting it into operation seems harder in practice for him than giving a wonderful TED talk. So I wonder how much it's a bandwagon you should jump on. How much would Sam have jumped on that? This was 2010. In 2012, I think it's 2012, um, Daphne Collar from Stanford gave this wonderful lecture on MOOCs, where she discussed the fact that there was a class of 400 and they wanted to make it bigger and it then became a MOOC, and it was opened up to everybody free of charge, and it was 100,000. And it was all free. In Reading University, we now produce MOOCs as part of a consortium. When we asked the people who were driving the MOOC production, and maybe you produce lots of MOOCs, when we asked Reading people why they're doing it, the answer was, it's better to be in than out, which didn't seem a very convincing answer. Before, if you're not spending lots of money in your wonderful new computer center producing MOOCs, you should also now look in 2016 at articles which discuss why MOOCs are dead. I don't think they're dead. Um, especially if you look at some of the sets of these, but they're certainly not being treated in the same way as they were. It's, it's difficult with computing. You've got to be careful which bandwagon you leap onto. But here's one I think that Sam would have taken, and this is what I'm finishing on. This is a very remarkable person called Neil Turok. He's a South African, but his parents who, as you can see, are white, were evicted from South Africa because they were against apartheid in the 70s. So he grew up in Kenya and Tanzania, went off to Cambridge, and he's worried about the origins of the universe. And he's written lots of papers with Stephen Hawkins, and he's now the director of the Perimeter Institute in Canada. But he never forgot his interest in Africa, and he has set up an inspirational MSc for African students doing mathematics. So they never have to go abroad to do their MSc. They can go abroad for their PhD, but they don't have to go abroad for their MSc. And it is a truly wonderful series of degrees. So TED, the, these series of TED Talks, they give prizes. And he won the TED Prize in 2008. And he used that to say, I don't want this one institute, which is regional, and you can see how many countries have benefited, I want to now have another one of these institutes. I want 15 of these. And so far he's got six, and funding from all over the world, and producing 300 very interesting MSc graduates who have an inspirational course. I find it interesting that if you remember back to the past with Professor Samaranaika, he had many dimensions, and one of them was his trips to Trieste. He was also very interested in physics. So this combination of a theoretical physicist worrying about many practical things, here's another kindred spirit. I feel sure Sam may have met him, but if he didn't, he should have done. And I do think 
that this is an African success story that other places could learn from, and I think Sam would have done that. So finally, I'd very sincerely like to thank you for this opportunity to give this talk. I feel it's a wonderful way for me personally to pay just a little bit my respects uh, to, uh, to Professor Samaranaika. He was such a privilege to know as a colleague and a friend, and it's wonderful as I see here and everywhere just how well he's remembered by so many people. Thank you all very much.